on our podcast questions hotline at 910-LJS-CAST. That's 910-557-2278. Leave us a voicemail with your jazz question, and you may just hear it answered on a future LJS podcast episode. That's 910-LJS-CAST. What is up, everybody? My name is Brent, and you're listening to the LJS Podcast, the podcast where you get weekly jazz tips, interviews, stories, and advice for becoming a better jazz musician. I'm so glad you're here listening today. No matter where you're listening from, whether it's from our home base at learnjazzstandards.com, iTunes, YouTube, anywhere in the world you're listening from, so glad that you're here Uh, I'm glad that you're listening today. Hope you enjoy the show. And on today's episode 57, I'm going to get a little bit personal with you. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to share my story with you. Today's episode is all about why I stopped hating my jazz playing and why you should stop hating yours. You know, a lot of musicians, and I find especially jazz musicians, are incredibly hard on themselves and tend to have low self-esteem about they're playing in general. And so I think this is an incredibly important topic to talk about today to to address. And and back in episode 52, uh, which is a really special episode, we had eight special guests on. It was our birthday episode. They all talked about musical failures they've had and how they bounced back from them. I talked about mine at the end of the episode, which is essentially around this topic today, uh, about how I beat myself up too much about my playing and how I ended up turning that Around And I promised to do a full episode more in depth on this. And so this is your episode. Here it is. I'm delivering just as I promised. But before we go into that today, if you've been listening to the show for a while and you really enjoy it and you get something out of it, you can give back by going to iTunes and leaving us a rating and review. That just helps other people find this podcast and helps us spread the word. Keep spreading the free jazz education around. Now, remember, if you want to ask a question on the show, on our segment, Ask LJS, you can call our podcast questions hotline. That's 910-LJS-CAST or 910-557-2278. Leave us a voicemail with a jazz question, and it could be answered on a future LGS podcast episode. Now, we're not going to do a segment of Ask LGS today. We've got a busy show ahead of us, uh, but we'll always be willing to take questions so always feel free to call in about that all right one last announcement before we jump into today's topic i've been talking about our new ebook zero to improv that we will be releasing and it's an ebook that walks you through how to become a great jazz improviser from the ground up we really try to leave no stone left unturned and it's for all instruments there's versions for c b flat e flat and bass clef instruments, and it's for all skill levels, and it's really an awesome book. We're so excited, and I'm really happy to announce that it's going to be released this week. Now, we're still not saying exactly what day it's going to be released. Uh, sign up for our newsletter, learnjazzstandards.com slash newsletter, if you really want to be in the know about that, but all I can tell you right now is it's going to be released this week, and in next week's podcast episode, I'll follow up on that. But if you want to be in the know, go sign up for our newsletter. That's the best way to always stay on the inside of everything that's going on. Super excited about this ebook. Super excited to share it with all of you. All right, now let's jump into today's topic. I want to describe a person to you, and you tell me if you can relate to this person at any moment in time in your musical endeavors so far. All right, this person, we're going to call her Diane. Diane always goes to her gigs, and she's constantly frustrated and upset with how she sounds. No matter what she plays, she's always not satisfied. You know, she takes a solo and and always ends up feeling embarrassed about it afterwards. She wishes she could do better. And actually, quite often, she finds herself listening to the best player on the bandstand wanting to be as good as them and comparing the way she plays to the way that person plays. She leaves every single gig upset, anxious, frustrated, and even before gigs or jam sessions, uh, she goes and, and, and and she plays. Before that even happens, she feels anxiety because she's 
worried about how well she will sound. And in fact, she's been practicing all day. She's been working really hard in the practice room relentlessly because she wants to sound great. Now, after these gigs, after she sounds, she feels anyways, like she sound terrible. She did a terrible job. She did. She didn't meet her expectations. She goes and she practices because she thinks that if she practices more, well, that's going to fix the problem. Oh, I know what I did wrong this time. I'm going to go to the practice room. And if I practice for you know, X amount of hours, I'm sure it's going to fix. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to get better. And she dreams constantly of the day of when she can play at that level that she wants to play at. And every single time she lets herself down, uh, her dreams are, and hopes are dashed on the rocks. You know, this is a very serious thing. You know, a bad solo equals disaster and depression sets in and she treads off to her practice room, night after night, day after day, trying to cure the disease that she thinks she has. Now, can you relate to Diane? (laughs) Because I know that I can. I find that with musicians, it kind of goes two ways. Either you have a really big ego, you think the world of yourself, or you really just have low self-esteem about your music. You always feel unsatisfied. And, And I think for a lot of us, that's where we end up being that's the camp we end up fitting in is in that side of I wish I was better and I don't feel good about my music and I want to be somewhere else anywhere else than where I am right now I find this to be an especially big problem with jazz musicians because jazz is not an easy music to play it really requires a lot of dedication and for those who who pursue this music they have to be somewhat serious about it and, and when you're really serious about something, when you really put your heart and your soul into something, you're really opening yourself up for the risk of, of failure, right? And no one likes failure. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm not someone I would consider to be a completely serious person by nature, but I am serious in the sense that whatever I do, I put 100% into it. I'm, I'm very much a... Either I'm all in or I'm not in at all kind of a guy. If you ask me to do something, I'm going to be doing it 100%. If I decide not to do it, I'm not going to be doing it at all. That's just who I am. And you know, when I first found jazz, I, I think I was around 16 years old. I started listening to jazz. You know, Some of my teachers in high school were showing me it. And I, I loved music and I thought it was an awesome music. And I was getting into it. I was getting addicted to it. It wasn't until... Maybe when I was 17 or 18 that I really got tied into a teacher and a community of jazz musicians and immediately I felt left behind. I felt like I was light years behind everybody else and I needed to catch up, okay? And that's where the root of the problem started. Yes, it was great because you know what? I had to work really hard. I worked really hard to try to catch up to everybody else and in fact... If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you may have heard my story about how after high school, I didn't go to college right away, which seems to be kind of the societal norm in the world. I actually studied with a teacher for a year, and I practiced for about five or six hours a day, and I had a program with this teacher, and I would check in at the end of the week and had to accomplish a bunch of things like learning a bunch of jazz standards and um, learning, you know, solos by ear. I mean, lots of, it was a great program. I learned so much that year, but that just shows you how serious I was. You know, I, I was practicing for six to seven hours a day, five to seven hours a day, every single day. I was very serious about this. Um, and so I put my heart and soul on the line for the music. Now, the following year, I got into a a bunch of colleges I wanted to get into, but I ended up deciding to go to Cornish College of the Arts in Seattle, Washington. Great school, by the way, and a great music city. And I I studied there for a year, and that the, my first year of college was pretty hardcore. You know, I had I made another friend that was just as equally serious as I was, and my day would pretty much go. I woke up in the morning, I took music classes all day. In between every single class, I was studying, I was practicing. And then at night, I found a little gig at a small bistro. I would play duo with my friend or solo guitar. I'm a guitarist, and I would be you know, practicing. And then after that gig, every single night, I'd go to the practice room, practice till midnight, 
till the building closed, till the music building closed. Then I'd go back down to my dorm, wake up and do it all over again. Now, of course, I'd give myself some break on the weekend, but, you know, I was pretty hardcore and that's how it was. And, you know, in my classes, I, I, in my combo classes, I was never happy with how I was playing. I was always a little disappointed, you know, and I was always comparing myself to some of the other better players around and, you know, wishing I could be as good as them. And I think one of my professors kind of noticed it and he always would approach me about it and say, hey, buddy, what's what's going on? Why are you always so down about what you're playing like and, oh you know I just want to be better I want to be really good and you know I, I, I just took this whole thing seriously I was so consumed and it kind of started here my first year of college where where this really started to consume me being too serious being constantly unhappy and you know there was a jam session in town I'd always go to the jam session and I started getting a lot of anxiety to play because it was the big session in town everybody was around and and, you know, at the time, I just didn't feel like I was as good as I could be. The truth being told, I think it was more in my head than it was actually reality. Um, but a lot of us find ourselves in that boat. And that's the way it was for me. Just constantly comparing myself to other musicians and wishing I could be as good as them. Now, the following year for my second year of college, I left Cornish behind. Not that there was anything wrong with the school. It was a great school. And I moved to New York City. Not completely, but largely because I had my sights set high. I wanted to move to New York, the center of jazz in the world. People from all over the world come to study jazz, the best jazz musicians, the best jazz scene. I wanted to be there. I had my sights set high. I wanted to go to New York. So that's exactly what I did. And truth be told, the best decision I ever made. I met my wife in New York City. I can attribute a lot of the success I've had in music so far to New York and I still live in New York to this day but I moved all of my stuff over to New York I was going to the City College of New York and my intense studying continued I continued to practice for long hours I continued to hunt down gigs and play gigs and that was awesome I would continue to become a better jazz musician all the time just from the sheer amount of playing and exposure that I had but with New York I became an even smaller fish in a big pond so many musicians here in New York the best all here in one spot so it was pretty easy to compare myself with other people and feel like I was not matching up Hey everybody, just taking a quick break from today's show to talk to you about our e-course, 30 Days to Better Jazz Playing. You know, I get emails almost every day from jazz musicians asking the questions, what do I practice and how do I practice? They know where they want to be in their jazz playing, they know how they want to sound, they're just not exactly sure how to get there. And that's why me and the LGS team have created our new e-course, 30 Days to Better Jazz Playing. 30 Days to Better Jazz Playing is an audio e-course that brings you through 30 days of focused, goal-oriented practicing where you're going to be working on things that will actually improve your jazz playing. This course is designed for all instruments and for all skill levels and is really great for anybody looking to practice with purpose and to make real improvement in their jazz playing. If you want to learn more about this e-course, go to learnjazzstandards.com slash 30 days. That's learnjazzstandards.com slash three zero days. I hope to see you in the course. Now, it was during this time, during my college years, that I would take a solo that was awesome or I'd have a great gig and I would be on cloud nine afterwards. Like no one could take me down from that high. But if I had a bad gig, or even if I played a bad solo, I would be the worst. I would feel the lowest of low. I'd be depressed. And that's because I had put too much of my self-worth into music. Music was dictating my self-worth. That's a very unhealthy mentality. Now, it was around the third year of college, I guess my junior year of college, where I finally just broke down. The culmination of those years just resulted me burning out. Emotionally, I was drained. Music was no longer fun for me. I'd forgotten why I had gotten into it in the first place. I'd forgotten the humor of music. I'd forgotten the excitement. I'd forgotten the joy. Seriousness and dedication almost drowned me. 
it, it thrown me off the edge of the dock, chained and sinking fast toward the bottom. And this, my friends, was the turning point. <laughs> this was the point where I decided hating my playing was not worth it. I decided that playing music because it was fun was more important than satisfying my success or satisfying my ego. And this is where things started changing for me. You know, it didn't happen like a flick of a switch, though. It, it took hitting rock bottom to kind of wake me up, and it took some of my mentors and my teachers to drag me out, not by intervention, but by simply being a living example of what it was to truly be in music for the journey and not the destination. Now, let me say that last part again, because this is a key point. Being in it for the journey and not the destination. Now, I, I really... If you find yourself today relating to my story, uh, relating to any of this, or, e or even feeling like you're there today, like you just constantly are unhappy with your playing, I want to beg you, I want to encourage you to start shifting the way you think about yourself. And let me go through some of the points I want to make to you to get yourself out of this rut of constantly being upset with your playing. I want you to stop hating your playing. I want you to start loving your playing. It doesn't matter where you're at in your musical journey. It doesn't matter if you're a beginner, intermediate player, advanced. It does not matter. I want you to change your thinking about how you approach music and how you think about yourself in relation to music. Now, number one, my first point I want to make to you today is you need to stop comparing yourself to others. This is insanely dangerous. Okay, I'm serious. This is insanely dangerous. Stop comparing yourself to the best player on the bandstand or stop comparing yourself to your peer who's a great player. You're not them. You're your own person. You learn at your own rate. You learn at your own pace. You started music when you started music. Now, we're all on the path together. Everybody is on this path. We're all headed the same direction, even though on different parts of that path we may be. You got to stop comparing yourself to others. And that takes practice. That takes a lot of practice. That takes switching your mentality to a new mentality, a fresh mentality that gets rid of that completely and that only worries about yourself. Now, I talked about this in an earlier podcast. I can't even remember which one at this point. But I talked about my older brother and how in high school he was on the track team and he was very uh, interested in, in his personal record, what they call the PR. In fact, it was funny because he wasn't really ever interested in winning races or winning in the long jump or the high jump. He just wasn't interested in that. And it always confused me because I had such a competitive attitude towards life. I always wanted to win. I was in it to win it. I wasn't in it for a personal record. But I learned a lot from my older brother because he was really focusing on this rather than winning. And as a result, it always seemed like he was kind of enjoying himself. He would come back from a track meet and be like, wow, hey, I just beat my personal record today. And I would always be like, great, that's awesome. But you know what? Years later, I thought about that. and I thought, man, he had it right. It's all about the personal record. Was I better this time than I was last time? Am I improving? And that was his focus. Okay, so the first point, stop comparing yourself to others and focus on you. Focus on your personal record. The second point I want to make to you piggybacks off the first one, and that is play from where you are at, not from where you want to be. Play from where you are at, not where you want to be. And I didn't get this from myself, you know, when I was, uh, I think, somewhere in between college and high school, I went to a, a master class um, with the great jazz guitarist Bruce Foreman. I've actually interviewed him on this podcast. It was one of the earlier episodes. Um, he's a great musician. And I was at this master class and he was there and he was hearing me play and he could just tell that I was really wanting to be better. He could sense a little bit of this feeling of dedication and seriousness but he also noticed that I was reaching for things and feeling upset that I couldn't quite grab them and I remember he specifically told me that exact same thing he said play from where you're at not where you want to be now what he did he didn't mean don't try to play better or don't try to improve he, he of course wants me to improve 
But what he meant by that was be okay with where you're at right now. Be able to accept the position you're in. And again, that goes back to this journey kind of way, looking at this as a journey. You know, you're where you're at and you're moving forward. That's what matters. It's not about the destination. And so remembering that you need to play from where you're at, not where you want to be, can be an incredibly valuable mindset for accepting your playing and turning and flipping that switch in your head. So play from where you are, not where you want to be. Now, the third point I want to make to you, and this one is incredibly important. The third point is you need to stop putting all of your self-worth into music. A lot of musicians who are serious about music put way too much of their self-worth into music. I know this because I was there, and I know this because I have a lot of friends that have or currently still do put way too much of their self-worth into into their music. And when you do that, that's the kind of that, that that results in that kind of behavior where if you play a bad gig, if you don't feel like you're playing at the top of your game, you don't feel good about yourself. And that's ridiculous, right? Because all of us are worth so much more than music. Uh, and if you're in that mentality right now, if you if you're really stuck in that putting too much of your self-worth into your music, I want to encourage you to get out of that as fast as you can. And maybe take a step back from music for a little bit, you know, take, take a step back from all that because maybe you need to separate yourself for a second and try to explore the other things that give you value because certainly there are more than one thing that gives you value as a human being in this world. So I would say for sure, one of the most important things is to realize that you're worth so much more than just music. Don't put all your self-worth into music. That is a recipe for disaster big one to start changing immediately. The last and final thing I want to leave you with is music should be fun. Remember why you got into this in the first place. Okay. If at any point you're starting to feel like music isn't fun anymore, that means you took the wrong turn somewhere and you need to reevaluate where you're at and why you're doing what you're doing still. Music needs to first and foremost always be fun. That's why you got into it. I don't even have to know you to know that that's why you got into it. You love music. You love jazz. You love playing, and and this is why you started doing it. Whether you're trying to pursue it professionally, whether you do it as a hobby, doesn't matter if you're a student in school. It doesn't matter what situation you're in. Make sure you're loving music. If it's turned the corner, if it's gone the opposite direction, it means you've gone wrong somewhere, and you need to step back and you need to turn it around. Stop hating your playing. Stop beating yourself up. It's not worth it. I'm here to tell you today, it is not worth it. Let's all be a little kinder to ourselves and start loving jazz, start loving the journey. All right, that's all for today's show. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And as always, if you want to add anything to today's show and contribute to today's podcast, you can go to the podcast show notes. That's at learnjazzstandards.com. Go to podcast in the top menu and find this episode 57. This is a jazz community and we always want to hear from you. Remember that if you enjoyed this show, you can give back to us by leaving a rating and a review on iTunes. That helps other people find this podcast. And remember, if you have a jazz question that you want answered on the show, call the podcast questions hotline. That's 910-LJS-CAST or 910-557-2278. Be on the lookout for our new ebook, Zero to Improv, that will be coming out this week. That's the week of April the 10th, 2017. If you're listening from the future, it could already be out. All right. Next week, we're going to be coming out with our episode 58 We'll see you then.